Hey everybody, Jamin here from Game Show. I'm out here on my roof again. Maybe I'll do a little like 360 panorama of my roof at some point. Anyway, so you probably noticed the news this week that uh, that Valve Software, the maker of the Half-Life series and uh, the uh, the keeper of the thing that is known as Steam, what, the largest digital distribution system for games in the world, over the past week announced that they were going to uh, allow for a paid program which would allow people to purchase mods. Mods had previously been free before and they decided to do this with Skyrim, which seemed like, you know, a good idea on the face. And then some things happened. So they announced the program and people weren't exactly happy about it for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, Gabe Newell, the company's longtime CEO, stepped into the fray on Reddit, had all of his votes down, um, all of his comments downvoted, uh, a fracas ensued, and then Valve issued a statement, a very thoughtful statement saying that they didn't quite understand how to release this into the marketplace. They pulled it down and uh, decided that maybe they will revisit the subject again in the future. So I had a bunch of you ask me about what I thought um, about this particular situation. So a lot of you obviously know what mods are. You've probably uh, downloaded them at some point in time. But for those of you who don't know, a mod is just a modified version of a PC game. It's really popular. It was uh, popularized first by Doom, uh, the makers of Doom. They started releasing uh, fan-made, fan-created maps. And uh, you know, one of the interesting things about games is that a lot of formal projects have started as mods. So you know, you have games like DayZ, for example, which started as a mod of Arma 2, the Stanley Parable, for example, which was a Half-Life 2 mod. Um, Gary's mod from the uh, the creators of Rust. This was their first big entrant, which was a, uh, a Half-Life 2 mod. So mod, mod, modding games is very close to the center of uh, what games are. And, you know, a lot of these companies, for example, have uh, have hired people who have modding in their background. It was often sort of a way that you could build a resume, so to speak, to be able to show the world what your game design potential was. And, um, you know, a lot of times uh, developers are inspired by the things that mods can do. They sort of serve as like this... Uh, uh, you know, de facto R&D department, where people modifying games show what's possible within the world of games. Um, so that first person perspective in Grand Theft Auto uh, 5 was something that was explored by the modding community for quite some time before becoming an official feature uh, for the newest version of Grand Theft Auto, um, for the update for Grand Theft Auto, or Min Lee, the co-creator of Counter-Strike, who was later hired by Valve. So there is this back and forth between the modding community and uh, and the world, the formal world of games. So there's a couple of things there at the heart of the issue, which is why it's really interesting to me. The first is about sort of what role mods play in terms of the larger, um, sort of the larger sort of ecosystem of created content. You know, it's really interesting. This is something I mentioned in the comments. Um, someone had asked me about this earlier. And one of the interesting things about the nature of mods is like, what are they exactly, right? So if you look at music, for example, you have different types of like remixes, reworks, re-edits. There are all these different sort of classifications for what something is. So a remix may take some of the pieces of a particular piece of music and rearrange it in a particular way, which an edit, whereas an edit might be, you might chop up a portion of the song and then play that for, uh, you know, for, for, um, for dance clubs or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because how those are monetized is actually totally different. So to, for something to qualify as a remix, there's a whole different system in terms of how you would collect money. I'll, look, I'll link to some stuff on Girl Talk, for example, um, who's a, obviously has taken a lot of other people's music and then sold it to the public. But remixing and sampling is something that has been, been a part of the music industry for quite some time. And monetizing that is a problem that's not necessarily solved, but it's one that's been wrestled with, which is what this makes this interesting about mods, whether mods are more like a cover song, right, where there's a mechanical royalty rate that's covered, uh, at least in the United States, where a certain amount of any cover song, for example, gets paid back to the original, uh, the original creator versus, um, versus a remix or something like that, where you might try to collect, you might be able to sell that for a separate price. So mods occupy this very, very interesting liminal space. So the argument for commercializing mods then um, becomes it's not just a philosophical issue, but also this practical one as well. The same way that like DJs creating uh, remixable music or selling remix music can be a part of their livelihood. So I'm very sympathetic to this idea that, you know, for modders, they put in all this um, sort of free labor into something and they're not necessarily able to um, collect on it. So they spend all this time making the 
this game better, other people download it, um, and so they want to be able to profit from it at some point in time. It's a way to sort of pay creators for thousands of hours of work that they've already put into something, at least that was the original intent for Valve. And also I think this idea that it could potentially lead to this cottage industry of people who are supporting themselves solely by modifying other people's games. Um, so modders are telling, saying that, you know, at least what I'm seeing is that they're saying it's, you know, that part of the issue is that freedom is what's essential to mods and so commercialization of mods sort of goes against not just sort of the ethos of creating them but also um, it also creates some impediments in terms of like how different things are shared if one person is trying to lock them up. So it's pretty clear that this issue is not one that's necessarily going to go away and in fact if we look outside of games as well which I always think is really important we see this larger idea of what Henry Jenkins uh, that he's a USC scholar of culture he calls convergence culture um, which is this idea that there's been this shift in media where the audience participates in creating entertainment as well as consuming it. And I think what Valve is at least attempting to do is try to place some types of commercial constraints or some sorts of commercial viability on it. Now obviously people were very upset about the split, 75, 25, 70% goes to Valve, 25% goes to the creator. But I think there's something a little bit larger here if you look at other attempts to try to commodify um, fan created content. So one good example of that was Kindle Worlds, which was Amazon's attempt to essentially do the same thing, which was to take fan fiction, which is this thriving, uh, a lot of similarities between fan fiction and modding, um, but fan fiction was this, you know, this very thriving community of people. Um, and you know, Amazon sort of stepped in and said, oh, well, we should try to create a universe where people can actually sell fan fiction. Um, books like Fifty Shades of Grey, for example, originally started as fan fiction of Twilight. So they're looking for a way to insert themselves into this process. And there's a great article from The Verve that I'll link to, Verge, that I'll link to in the description, which is that part of the problem is that sometimes these larger companies misunderstand what the core motivation is for people modding in the first place. Um, there's often this, there's this collaborative process and the motivations for people aren't necessarily commercial so people are making mods not necessarily because they think that they're going to make a lot of money um, or in the case of ebooks as this verge article points out is that the motivation is you know I'm gonna write this story for my friend and then my friend's gonna sort of add something to it and there's gonna be this sort of open back and forth or someone else decided to draw fan art for me on tumblr so I'm gonna draw fan art for them or leave a two-page paragraph for, for, um, for how much they enjoyed it so the motivations for people who are sort of creating uh, you know audience driven content is not necessarily the same and that's what makes this so so perilous um the thing i will say is you know i think that there is some sort of middle ground here between um being able to monetize the things that you've put your hard you know love and work into and the sort of freedom and freewheeling culture that is fan created content um, i think that valve has been really open-handed in terms of wanting to do this in a way that's respectful of the community i think their decision ultimately to return all the money and uh sort of revisit that the issue only demonstrates that they have a commitment to at least attempting to understand what that might look like. But it's really interesting for me because, you know, I think that in a lot of ways games are ahead of other forms of culture and so I think this is something that we're going to see and I think that this experiment with modding and Steam is something that we're going to see in other places as well. Don't be surprised if, you know, Netflix starts trying to take fan created content and, you know, perhaps make it something that's available on Netflix that they collect uh, subscription revenue against. Would not be surprised by that one little bit. Anyway, I know this is uh, obviously like a very, very uh, controversial and uh, obviously heated topic so I'm looking forward to what you all have to say and I'll see you next week.